This is ODAT Chat, your instant connection to recovery and community, one day at a time. This podcast may contain strong language, sexual content, and spiritual truth. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the ODAT Chat Podcast. My name is Arlena, and I'll be your host. Before I jump into the episode overview, there are some kick-ass recovery resources I wanted to share with you. On the podcast website, you will find a list of books that I reference in this episode and previous episodes. So you can find it at odatchat.com and odat is spelled O-D-A-A-T for those of you that don't know. Okay, and if you like the Audible versions of these books, you can get your first book free when you sign up for an Audible subscription through the link on the homepage. That's it for the book resources, but there is also a list of recovery podcasts similar to this one that you will absolutely love. My personal feeling is that we're stronger together, so I'm happy to share some some of the best recovery podcasts like The Bubble Hour, hosted by my friend Jean McCarthy. She was actually a guest. There's The Share Podcast, hosted by the dynamic and ever-fabulous Omar Pinto. And last but certainly not least, uh, Light Hustler by the amazing, I believe she is a New York Times bestseller author, Anna David. She's amazing. You will love her. She's super funny. Um, lastly, check out Sober Nation, which has tons of articles, a network of a podcast that hopefully I'll be a part of at some point, and an online community. So links will be listed in the episode show notes as well as the website. So these are some of the resources I use in my daily life that help me. So I think they will help you too. In today's episode, um, this is actually part two with my super smart and interesting friend, Neil. I just realized I've said super a bunch of times, but in this case, it also applies. (laughs) I had too much to talk to him about to fit it all on one episode, so he came back. As it turns out, the conversation (laughs) kind of turns into a little bit of therapy for me, but it presented an opportunity for Neil to share some some meaningful insights. So you're welcome. (laughs) I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So without further delay, please enjoy this encore episode with Neil. Well, Neil, thank you for joining me on the podcast. I'm back. You're back. So you're the first person (laughs) to come back for round two. I'm excited about that. I know. Well, listen, we had so much to talk about the first time, and then we kind of ran out of time. So we just barely scratched the surface on atheism. Um, I have lots of questions about that because I grew up in the church. So, right. But I'm also kind of a science girl, kind of, well, I don't want to say I'm an intellectual. But <laughs> <laughs> I do want to challenge my own thinking, and I have over the, you know, I'm a big girl, you know, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what do I really believe and what has been indoctrinated. So I'd love yeah, to. Yeah, I'm a super big fan of picking a fight with what I think I believe. Okay, yeah. Because until I pick a fight with it, I'm never really sure. I'm not convinced of what I believe. Right. And that means you can threaten it anytime. Yeah. But once I've picked a, picked a fight with it, then I really know where I stand with it, whether yeah. it's I really own it or it, it, I can discard it. Like it's a defendable then, position, right? Right. Then you can't hurt me. Right. And I can choose to agree or disagree with you. But mm-hmm. until I've done that, I'm constantly threatened by everything. Yeah. And that's kind of the litmus test of how I became an out-of-the-closet atheist. <laughs> out-of-the-closet. Yeah. Did you, why do you say out-of-the-closet? Was there a, a sense of feeling ashamed about it? Or persecuted, maybe? Uh, no, I, you know, I never didn't really concern myself with that i was i played along i never really believed in a higher power but i got sober young and dove in with the young people and i just rolled with whatever they were doing Mm -hmm. but i had this sense in the back of my head that some of the stuff that i was hearing at meetings and some of the stuff that was written in the book i just didn't agree with because i had evidence in my own personal life that contradicted it Mm -hmm. But I would play along and say God, and I'd do the Lord's Prayer and stuff like that. And 
when I worked steps with people, we talked about God. Mm -hmm. And in the back of my head, what I was using was the spirit of the principles. Okay. And that became more and more formulated over the years as being what my real core value is, is, is that I worship the principles. Okay. And, the war, and the principles are common amongst all of us, regardless of God or no God, religion, which mm -hmm. flavor. Right. We all have the principles in common, and, and so we have that common language. And That's so now when I work with people, I still talk about God with them, with them knowing that I'm an atheist. With you them, use the term. Yeah, because that's the language that they're comfortable with. Right. And we have that common language of the principles, so it doesn't, source doesn't matter. Source doesn't matter. And even the book says source doesn't matter. It does. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. In what context? Your relationship with your creator is none of my business. Okay. It's not my job to sell you on a specific version uh, of God. Yeah. My job is to help you practice principles within that belief system. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, sponsor sponsorship is a funny thing where you really are not supposed to be pushing your ideas onto somebody right. else. We're really supposed to be focusing on just the actual steps, right? But I find myself temp being tempted to want to do, like, therapy and I do <laughs> I do bring God into it all the time. It, it's each person is different. And so yeah. I can get some some guy Carney used to you'd, you'd line twenty people up that John Carney sponsored mm -hmm. and ask twenty all of them how he sponsored them and you get fifteen different answers. Okay. Because he was really good at meeting you wherever you were at. Oh. And that was that was my one huge takeaway from John when John worked with me is is I got that, and so I carried that into how my, you know my sponsorship style in working with others mm -hmm. is I figure I find out where you're coming from what you need mm -hmm. and and what your position is in things and then I meet you there I don't try to bring you over to my side right because you're not going to get sober or get spiritual. On my timeline, you're going to get it on yours. Right. Yeah. You have to meet someone where they're at. That right. Makes sense. Yeah. You'd be a good sales guy. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> Except I can't lie. <laughs> you know that. I think that's a common misconception about sales is that you really do have to meet people where they are and find out like where the gaps are in order to make, make sense about things. Right. And new ideas, really. And so as a sponsor, you're... I have found that I am trying to present new ideas to people. And so if you don't start with where they are, it's not going to make any sense. Right. Yeah. And, and new ideas to myself. Right. I have to keep growing spiritually too. Right. So you use the term you're growing spiritually. So if you don't believe in a higher power and you believe in principles, what's... I mean, there. So there's like I don't even know where to start with this. the higher power thing. Because um, when I first got sober, I had a sponsor that took me to El Paseo, this outdoor mall that had an outdoor fountain. Uh -huh. It was really tall, and we were doing our third step prayer. I was turning my will and my life over to the care of God, and she had me step into the the fountain. <laughs> and Kimmer's what a rebel. She had me step into the fountain. And there was like this wall and it had water coming down the wall and she had me put my hands. She goes, okay, now make it go the other way. I was like, bitch, you crazy. <laughs> what are you talking about? She was like, that's a power greater than you. And I was like, oh, okay. Because when I first got sober, I, I was confused that because I had grown up with the church and oh. then couldn't do it right. But I, I later realized I misunderstood the purpose of church, but... I wasn't doing what I thought I was supposed to be doing, and I thought I was going to be condemned to some alternate, right. very bad universe. <laughs> so I decided if I couldn't be good, I was going to be good at getting back. So I yeah. just totally went away from church and God because I thought I was supposed to be a certain way. And then I come into the program, and I'm, like, so desperate. I was like, God, help me, <laughs> you know. And then magical things started to happen from that place of surrender. I bet you've experienced this too when you reach this like energy level within yourself of surrender. Yeah. Like where you're 
finally ready to let go of what you think you know in order for something new to come in. And that almost felt like, like, I don't know if it's necessarily, like, I don't care if we call it God or whatever it is. It did feel like an energy that was different and better than what I was currently working with. Right. But I would call that serotonin or dopamine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and just because I look at the science and biology mm-hmm. and physics and Darwinian psychology yeah. of things doesn't mean that I lose the, the majesty and, and the amazing feeling of it when, when things happen. Okay. I, I lose none of that. All right. So, yeah, that does make sense to me, though, that, yeah, dopamine and serotonin being released. Yeah. But couldn't it be that... Like, once I had a, an awareness and was able to surrender, I don't know. It doesn't, it seems like, uh, is it, that's just my biology taking over at that point from my psychology? Once, 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 once I've hit bottom mm-hmm. and I've, I've completely surrendered, yeah. like Bill had the, had the, the blinding white light, right? you know, and, and threw himself from his bed in, in town's hospital. Mm-hmm. And I'm reading that, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, he's going through DTs. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And and that was his spiritual experience was yeah. was a seizure. A seizure. And no one's argued with me against that, but that but that's my interpretation of what he calls a miracle. Yeah. I'm looking at the the physiology behind it, and that's probably what happened. Okay, the physiology behind it. No, that's really cool. And I don't care. I mean, I'm not out dissuading anybody from from their right. belief about that. No, that's yeah. that's your miracle. That's what you need to see. Yeah, yeah. No, I I could see. I, I like that. I like because I do like explaining things with science. And there are times when I sit at meetings and people give credit to God, and I and I'm just so confused sometimes because I do feel like, yeah, well, you let's see here. You did all the way. You did all kinds of work. And you got a result. Why? Right. Why is that a? Uh, why are you chalking that up to God? Or, yeah, I don't know. I wish I had a very specific example, but I, I do sit in meetings and, and sort of. But I also feel like I have a spiritual practice that, when I'm in it and asking for help, like things happen in my orbit uh-huh. that that feel magical. Yeah, because I I, ch- I shift consciousness. I go from worshiping fear to worshiping love. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. those are my higher or lower consciousness. And when I'm worshiping love, I'm practicing honesty and open mindedness, yeah. willingness, courage, integrity, brotherly love, service. Okay, those are the principles you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Okay. And and when I'm worshiping fear, I get into the character defects. How do you define worshiping? Giving energy and attention to. Okay. Yeah. Like you would give attention and energy to your belief in God mm-hmm. and and direct your energy to that aiming for higher consciousness. Okay. You call it God. I call it love. Okay. Uh, well, actually, that's how I define God is, is love at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Which is why I, I have no problem whatsoever in discussing atheism versus humanism versus whatever your religious beliefs may be Mm -hmm. because we all have the common language in the middle there that we can all discuss yeah i feel like if you throw out the word god everyone's kind of on board like people define it differently but i think we call we all kind of have like this understanding that there's like this energy that's undefinable like you can't really define it completely yeah that's good that's good for those of us who've been there for a while and we've kind of owned our seat Mm -hmm. and we know we belong yeah one of the reasons why i decided to come out as an atheist and to say hey i'm an atheist Mm -hmm. at at meeting level is because i was sitting in a meeting one night and this guy was talking and he said don't pray for patience because god will throw all kinds of situations in your life where you have to practice patience and it's going to be horrible and i sat there going no I've heard this same drag 20 times. Mm -hmm. And my experience with that is when when I contemplate patience, I become very keenly aware of just what an impatient asshole I am. Yeah. None of my outer circumstances actually change. Uh I just become aware of my place in those 
circumstances. You become aware of your inability to be patient. Yeah. And then in that awareness of like being impatient, do you, it gives you an opportunity to practice and you find that over time you become more patient. Mm Mm-hmm. It's kind but, of the but, but, I be, but I become aware of it. And what this guy was saying is... that is, God gives it to you. Yeah, God dumps <laughs> trouble on you. And, mm. and I thought, no, no, yeah. that doesn't make any sense at all. And people are going to listen to that yeah. and try really hard to buy into that, that belief system. And it's, it's a failure. That's interesting that he would say, don't pray for patience. Well, he said, be careful about praying for patients. Mm. And I've heard people use that (laughs) same kind of shtick for any principle. Don't pray for whatever because then X is going to happen. At at that moment, at that meeting, that was, I don't know, 15 years ago, I said, nope, I need need to let people know that there there is another angle here. And I knew many people that had left the program because they felt like they couldn't have it because they didn't believe in God. I have heard, yes. I and heard that. and there is a great difference between the, our literature mm-hmm. and what people see in meetings. Mm-hmm. The the meeting culture is quasi religious. Oh, it absolutely. And is. for a newcomer walking in, who you know, they, maybe they had a horrible upbringing in the Christian church, or mm-hmm. you know, whatever the story okay. was, right. or they never had a belief at all. Mm-hmm. They walk into this, they're court ordered to, or they walk stumble into this. Help self help program and and they're doing the Lord's prayer and they're doing the Serenity prayer and it's God 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 throughout and people condescend to you mm, if you don't if you don't if you don't buy in if you don't buy into God they say uh, find a God of your own understanding they use that escape clause that's an but escape. the way they treat people very often in meetings is is a condescending oh well God may run you out but alcohol will run you back oh that, I've never that, heard that yeah oh, yeah. And at the time that I decided to do this, my purpose in doing it was there's 50 people in a meeting and 45 of you are all good with the varying degrees of, of God. Right. There's five in the back that feel like they're never going to get this. Mm-hmm. So I'm speaking to them. You okay. 45 are good. I'm not worried about you. Yeah. And if you're offended by my atheism, eh. Yeah, I don't mind offending people. I've been sober ideas. forever. You're not going to run me out, and I've probably sponsored more people than you, and yeah, whatever. Yeah, and, and now, I'm good. I was, and I, and you'll hear it in the intro. You haven't heard your last episode yet, but I, in my intro, when I describe you and Stephanie, it's like you guys have cultivated a community of people who are on the fringes. Yeah, right. It's like you gave them a home. And I wonder what would happen to these people had it not been for you and Stephanie. I mean, right. created a safe place for people who are, and, and listen, we're already a community of outcasts. Right. <laughs> right. And then to be outcast and then this community where you're supposed to feel safe, you know, that has to leave people feeling super isolated. Yeah. The, the, the whole purpose of fourth, the fourth dimension is that we're, the list in the third tradition in the 12 by 12, mm-hmm. the list of everything that AA didn't want okay. in, the, in that cautionary tale in the, in the, in the third tradition mm-hmm. were the prisoners, queers, playing crackpots, fallen women, and, and all those. Mm-hmm. I thought and, all the women in AA were fallen women. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. In fact, when we say fallen women during the, the intro, they all go, woo! <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Ain't no shame in my game. Right, right. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. No, so yeah. we tend to be uh, there. There's a fair amount of bisexual, gay, transgendered, sex workers, artists. Current sex workers. Some. Really. Yeah. What time is this meeting? <laughs> <laughs> what time should I be there? <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm not saying I'm a sex worker, but. But, think but it, think yeah, people, in the, people in the kink world. Mm-hmm. But it's not necessarily all that. Mm. It's just all people that, that feel like they're not the normal fit for AA. Right. And we talk about everything there. We're not a, you talk about alcohol and that's it. Or, yeah. or we kind of look at it as, uh, if it happens in my sobriety, it happens in my recovery. If it happened in my disease, mm-hmm. it's part of my program. Yeah, absolutely. And I should be able to talk about it. Yeah, because we were talking earlier. I don't know anybody that has just one addiction. Right. Yeah. 
And that's kind of why I started the podcast, because I wanted to be able to talk about all that other stuff that yeah. we're not supposed to talk about in the rooms. Yeah. I, I was t- uh, telling my niece on the way home that I was going to do the podcast today, and I explained that it was your your opportunity to be able to put out there all the stuff that we're not supposed to talk about in meetings. Yeah. You know, so, so everybody else knows that, oh, I'm not the only one. That goes right. through this, feels this, struggles with this. Yeah. And, and that's valuable and important. Uh, yeah, I think so, right? There's, so, listen, there's so much. And that's why there's all these other 12-step groups, because right. people want to talk about their specific issue. And I'm not sure, like, the language is important around, like, I've been talking to people on the podcast that are, I've talked to sex addicts, gambler, gamblers, people who struggle with eating disorders. Yeah. And it always comes back to the same type of solution. To me, it doesn't matter what the problem is. The solution is the same. But there's something so healing about and really connecting when you find a group of people who struggle the exact same way that you do. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. But yeah. in context to the secondary and tertiary addictions, mm-hmm. if, if I'm going to a meeting and we're only talking about alcohol and recovery from alcoholism, mm-hmm. that's good for a while. But then I'm drifting off into escapism because we're escape artists. Oh my god! And and I deal with I do yeah. I work around the steps maybe, you know, yeah. and and I get relief from alcohol. Mm-hmm. Then my mind is still kind of wired towards escape, yes. and 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 wired to feel apart from. And I probably haven't gotten the chemical imbalances that we almost all of us have in mm-hmm. the program. Uh, haven't got those straightened out yet. So. I'm still feeling ill at ease. Right. You know, maybe I got some, a little taste of the night step promises, mm-hmm. but as a whole, mm-hmm. they're not, they haven't sunk in yet. I, I really believe that I, I've seen a lot of people go out around four to six years, we call it the five year thing, mm-hmm. because there comes a point at somewhere between four and six years where all this, all my character defects that I still was kind of holding on to, mm-hmm. that still kind of worked for me. The bottom falls out on those. And and at that point, I either have to say, I'm completely recommitting myself to this process, Mm -hmm. or fuck it, screw A, it doesn't work. Double down or bounce. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. And a lot of that has to do with the secondary and tertiary addictions not working anymore, you know, because we're still practicing those, whether it's anger or sex addiction or martyrdom codependency oh my god the martyrdom <laughs> i cannot tolerate the martyrdom but it's all attempts to try to control and feel safe in my in, in my own skin right you know in, in my in my environment you know and, yeah. and i have a psychological understanding of what the principles are mm-hmm. but they haven't for the majority they haven't really dropped from my head to my gut yet yeah because as a matter of time I haven't had time to let them become a part of my DNA yet. It does take time. Yeah. These ideas take time for them to really take root and sort themselves out. It absolutely is true. It took me two years from the time that I hit my bottom to finally coming into the rooms. It took me two years to wrestle with the idea of what is an alcoholic and when did I cross the line. And it, it, one question led to another, to another. Right. and. But it took me two years of wrestling with that to finally show up. And then it took me like 60 days to get 30. And then it was okay. But I felt like that. And looking back now, I feel like that was pretty quick. <laughs> because Yeah, it can be. Two years. to From just, the point you started questioning it for mm-hmm, the first time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you know what happened is I, very beginning, I came across Tony Robbins. <laughs> I know, and it's, I, I always get that reaction, but oh, Tony Robbins is like a big joke. But it was interesting because I was introduced to a different thought system, meaning I wasn't aware that I could change the way I behaved. Because I, I started, I was in sales at the time. I had just started my first sales job. And I was dating the boss. I was sleeping with my boss, uh, but I was working for him and his wife. Uh (laughs) So it was a little awkward. Right. She wasn't aware of how awkward it was, really. (laughs) But, I mean, I was living in this. Or she was conveniently not paying attention to it because it served her purposes. Maybe. Because homeboy cheated on that woman from the day they started dating, practically. And they're still married. It's been 25 years, probably. Yeah. Well, women aren't stupid. Sure, some of them are. <laughs> Listen, but the reason I bring that up is I forgot. Why am I bringing this up? 
I just wanted to tell you how bad I was, I think. <laughs> Tony Robbins. Oh, thank you. Your thank you. Thank you. So uh, I was in sales and I have this ambitious drive. Like I grew up kind of poor. And so I was like, I didn't want to live that way. So I was in sales and, and I, I got this a hold of this Tony Robbins thing. And because I wanted to change my behavior and I couldn't. Right. And I would do like all these like goal setting workshops, exercises that uh -huh. are in his program. But it was to change my behavior. And the top of the list was always stop doing drugs and alcohol. And I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't. But it, I the path was laid out for me. It's like it was <clears throat> all, not religious, but all like behavioral change. Like, what is your why? What are your values? Like your core beliefs? How do you like? I got it that if I changed my beliefs and my thoughts, that I could change my reality, mm -hmm. right? And and I didn't wasn't even aware that that was that was a thing. Like I could do that. I thought I was who I was, and that if I just worked hard enough, that I would get stuff. Right. But I couldn't make myself do it. And then it was like, oh, it's because of the way you think. It's your core beliefs. So that wasn't religious, right? But it's still life changing. Right. And that was oh, the, for sure. Yeah. That, and so that was the first time I was aware that I could change. I thought I could change my belief system and my behaviors. Turns out I couldn't get rid of the drugs and alcohol until I got to AA and use the concept of God and a higher power. That was what I was comfortable with. And I was. Were you, were you doing the Tony Robbins thing by yourself? Yeah. That's also a big difference. Yeah. For me, community is so important. Yes, huh? as as important as the steps is, community is just as important. Oh yeah, and and that's a truism for any organization on the planet. Mm -hmm. Having a sense of community and belonging yeah. goes so much further than almost any other component of of the group. I would have to agree 100%, and I'll refer to that study that they did with the rats. Like, they put a rat oh, yeah. alone with a bottle of water with cocaine in it, and then another bottle of just water, and the rat drank the cocaine water until it died. But then someone said, hey, let's put the rat in Rat Park, and <laughs> let's give it lots of toys, let's give it other friends. Yep. And the two bottles were still there, and none of the rats drank the cocaine water. Yeah, but a they sense were of purpose and belonging. Yeah. And and connection yep. Yep. and I feel like loneliness as an alcoholic that feeling of isolation and just dis being disconnected that's where the source of my pain was yep and yeah and how that's that's why we, when we uh, we have our meetings on Saturday nights mm -hmm. and after the meetings over we do it in the backyard or on the fire so we just keep the fire going and throw some music on mm -hmm. and eat and laugh and connect with each other on Everything other than just recovery. Right. You know, not just meet and speak. We can talk about life and, and things that crack us up and, and things we're passionate about. And yeah. we build those bonds with each other. Right. And, Multifaceted. And, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that makes a big difference. Huge difference. Yeah. I, ha I go to the ODAP meeting, the 6 a.m. meeting, and I feel like that's a, like I bond and connect with those people outside the meeting. Yeah. Which is hugely important. Yeah. At Denny's? Mm, and then we go to the Las Gatas Cafe, one next to Nob Hill. Oh, it's not the 6 a.m. meeting that... Oh, no, 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 not Denny's. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that once. Yeah, that's a, that's a rough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> it's 6 a.m. <laughs> well, the other 6 a.m. is like a lot of professionals, like a lot of business professionals, like Silicon Valley. Like there's some... Yeah, not that. <laughs> <laughs> But it's funny, I am, but you and I still connect because we have so much in common. Oh, absolutely. No, no, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not making a, I'm not a Silicon Valley guy, so we can't be friends. Yeah. No, I, I get along with all kinds of flavors and yeah. styles you and do. sizes. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm a little judgy, I have to admit. There are some meetings where I don't feel like I, like I feel uncomfortable. Like I've chaired the Denny's meeting where people are like, there's like mental illness and homelessness uh -huh. and and I remember but this is a funny thing I will go into that meeting and go oh my god they're not going to relate to me at all they're not going to get anything out of my story cuz frankly you know I grew up in Sunnyvale <laughs> you know it's like in Cupertino so right like you know Vanillaville kind of yeah, yeah. <laughs> at least it was then <laughs> yeah yeah pretty much <laughs> But as soon as I start talking, I'm always reminded and surprised that it doesn't matter what our certain situations are. The feelings are all the same. Yeah. 
we all feel isolated. We all feel different. We all feel the need to change the, you know, change how we feel. We use, you know, so. Yeah, always, the, the insights is all very comparable. Very comparable. You were talking earlier about thinking your way into right living. Yeah. You know, and, and early in, uh, after, after I got into recovery, there was a whole pile of us that got crazy about Dermot Fox's Sermon on the Mount. Oh, yeah. You and, like that? Oh, yeah. Okay. I've taught that book several times over the years. Wow. And even then, I was agnostic, leaning towards atheism. But Fox's study on Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes is where I got mm. my super big passion about the principles and, and them being absolutes. Okay. And, and the, the idea... The principles are absolutes. Yeah. And the idea that, that I can I can see the east foothills and throw a rock at it, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to hit the east foothills. Mm-hmm. But if I give it everything I got, I'm going to get a hell of a lot further than if I lob the rock to the fence that's 20 feet away. Right. And, and in that way, I learn how to practice the principles deeper and deeper. Yes. By yeah. doing them in, okay. in areas and ways that are super uncomfortable. Because if they're absolutes, that means... That, that honesty is absolutely correct all the time. But I have this list of mm-hmm. things that I can't be honest about. And even more so, I can't be honest to myself about them. Right. And so when I push myself and try to practice that principle when it's inconvenient and uncomfortable and scary, mm-hmm. that's when I actually grow. Oh. Never when it's easy. Okay, here's a funny thing, and you can do a little therapy with me here. (laughs) Because I recently, so I have this, I have this belief that if you spot it, you got it, Mm -hmm. right? If we can't love or hate something about somebody else unless it's something we love or hate about ourselves. And so early in my recovery, I decided I was going to try to have the courage to acknowledge that whenever I'm upset with somebody else, whatever it is that is at the core of me judging them, like, for instance, there's somebody in my life and I've been wrestling with this idea that maybe they're constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves, right? And then I go, fuck, does that mean, that means I'm unconstitutionally incapable of being honest with myself on some level. And I really do want to be honest, but it's hard for me to see my own lies because I'm trying to, I'm trying to protect something. Right. And I don't know what it is. <laughs> I kind of know what it is, but it's like this, like I feel like I have, like I'm ambitious and trying to do things, but I also have like a pretty healthy level of fear, right? And I recently acknowledged that I have a core thing of safety. Like that's my, like my core value. Like Uh everything revolves around being safe. Like I want to keep my kids safe. I want to be healthy. Right. I want to be safe, safe, safe. But that is in direct conflict with ambition. <laughs> it's like, true. you know what I mean? It's so it's like I, I'm switching jobs and I'm like, oh, God, what if I don't? What if I'm not successful? Or, like yeah, I've, that's scary. It's so scary. And it's like, so, OK, I have to be honest with myself about my day to day activities, which is and when you're in sales, you're facing rejection all the time. Right. So it's like, oh, I wish. You know, I know. Anyway, I feel like so. I'm, so two years ago. This girl brought a guy over to the meeting for the first time. He was at CDRP, and he had like three days clean. Mm -hmm. And he'd been in and out and in and out forever. And she knew him from the punk scene. And she brought him to the meeting. She said, you're going to love this meeting. And she brought him to me specifically because she was an atheist. And part of his big issue with AA was the whole God thing. The new guy was an atheist? Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, so we got to talk, and and we figured, okay, I'm going to work with you, and... Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to work some steps together. And I was on this website uh, around the same time called AA Agnostica. And it's all things recovery towards uh, atheism, agnosticism, and mm-hmm. other. We had like a daily reflections book and all kinds of different literature written by different people. And I saw this book on there called The, uh, the, the Alternative 12 Steps, A Secular Guide to Recovery. And... I saw, I saw that and I read the preface and read a few pages out of it and I thought, I like this. I'm going to screw it. I'm buying two copies and him and me are going to go through it together. Hmm. And we sat down for twice a week until we were done reading a chapter at a time. I would read a page, he would read a page, I would read a page, and we'd discuss it. 
as we went. And and it was so earth-shatteringly refreshing because mm. for me, because I've been doing the big book for 30 years. Yeah. And I'm like Neo at the end of The Matrix <laughs> with 50 Mr. Smiths, yeah. you know, and, and I can sleepwalk my way through it. Right. And I've done it so many times that my ego knows exactly how to parse and yeah. sidestep yeah. And, and bullshit my way through it uh-huh. without actually learning anything new anymore. Yeah. And, I, and about 10 years ago, I started making people do the four column four step backwards. Start with your part? Mm-hmm. So... Oh, that's interesting. Normally, I, you would do you would do the inventory as I I'm mad at so and so because this happened and it affected these areas of my life, and I was this. Mm-hmm. Reading it backwards, it's I am this. It affects these areas of my life, causes this problem with this person, Ooh, and boom! That's so I, good. The first time I do it with people, I watch the seven stages of grief. <laughs> Go over their face <laughs> in, in, in like 30 seconds. The, the bargaining uh-huh. and anger and denial and, and, and finally acceptance. Uh-huh. Were, because we've been doing it this way forever. And right. we can, again, I can... I can a good way to start, but um, you're right. You do get sort of... Um, yeah, I don't do it that way with new people. Okay. And just like I don't do the alternative 12 steps with new people. Okay. I want them to have the foundation first. Right. And after that, then we can branch out and do and do it backwards and do it backwards and do the uh, the alternative twelve steps and the the I'll, the reason I bring up that book is because the stuff you're talking about mm-hmm. about denial and and yeah, uh, things that I blind myself to its version of the four step is to ask me eight questions eight just eight questions okay and they're very specific questions about different aspects of my life and. I can answer them any way I want to because I'm going to I'm going to write about whatever is pertinent and important to me at the time. Okay. And is it, it teaches me how to think about situations in my life, not what to think about them. So I can oh. take that process and plug it into anything that I'm struggling with, any person I'm struggling with, any behavior I'm struggling with. Right. Okay. It's it's teaching how to think about something, not what to think. Right. That's genius. Yeah. Yeah. A thought system. Yeah. yeah. And it was written by two women. Uh-huh. So it has a whole different angle on the 12 steps than uh-huh. Bill could have. Right. Bill couldn't have thought they give it they give a a, a full a full form perspective on the steps. Mm-hmm. Because in in ways that only women could see. Mm-hmm. And since all of us have masculine and feminine energy, mm-hmm. it it really addresses a lot more of the things inside all of us. A more holistic approach. Yeah. That's interesting. And and it deals a lot about in in denial. Because one of the women that wrote it is in an AA, she's uh Al-Anon. Al-Anon. So so it deals in codependency as well as oh. addiction and addresses gambling and sex and love and overeating, undereating. Right, all of it. All that. It it mentions all of it in passing. It doesn't hyper focus on anything. Mm-hmm. Cuz it doesn't matter. It's it's about what the solution is. So that's, that's an interesting exercise. So start with, I might actually have to try this. So you're saying, <laughs> if I were to try this exercise, I would start with what I think my character defect is or what my part is. or In regards to those eight questions? So, oh, so I start with the eight questions first and that leads to doing an inventory backwards. Oh, you want to do the the, mm-hmm. the four column format that we all, we all know and are used to? Yeah, I'm going to try that. And do it backwards? Yeah. Yeah, well, you would write it out the way we always write it out. Okay. And then read it back backwards. Oh, you just read it back backwards. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Right, because that tricks your brain. It does. If it you does. write it out backwards, your brain is going to play little mind games to yeah. still get the same result I'm used to that's comfortable and safe. Yeah. You know, little bits of ego I can nibble on that's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's tough to do that big leap. I felt like in the in the beginning of sobriety, I was able to grow in leaps and bounds because my life was so wildly out of whack that yeah. a few simple things helped me to grow in leaps and bounds. But you know, uh, almost twenty three years later, I don't. I get the I get little bumps every once in a while. We get lazy like, and comfortable. Yeah, my life is my life is pretty good. It works, but when it comes to like, I really believe that I allow in my life what I feel like I deserve. Right. Yeah. And I, my house is relatively small. I feel safe 
in a small house. And in my mind, I feel like, oh, well, if I had a lot of money, I would get a big house. Well, in a small house, I am always aware of my entire perimeter, uh-huh. right? And I know where my boys are at all times. I know where my dog is. It makes me feel safe. Like, so having a big house... It's actually kind of scary to me. Right. Like, no one's going to break in here. You know what I mean? It's like, maybe they will. But I, a big house, that seems like for sure, like, that's, you know, where the robbers want to go or the house intruders or yeah. whatever. So I go into these jobs where I can make lots of money, but I sabotage because I, uh huh. you know what I, I mean? I totally get that. I'm in direct conflict. It's like, how can I fix this? That's something I, w- I would really like to work on. I'm looking for tools to help me try to change that belief system i am actually i actually have a friend who's a coach and so you know it's like a sort of that tony robbins Uh philosophy of change your beliefs you know about you really should check out the alternative 12 steps the the alternate alternative 12 steps the alternative 12 i'm going to okay and that's what the eight questions Uh okay i'm going to do that i'm writing this down okay i've I've taken about 20 people through it in the last mm-hmm. year and a half. Mm-hmm. All the guys I sponsor that have over 20 years, mm-hmm. especially, and they right. all they all had the same reaction to it. A couple of them were stringent Christians, and they were absolutely thrilled with it. Yeah. Because it's not bullying about God or mean spirit in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. And, and it talks about spirituality quite a bit, mm-hmm. but in a different context, the, the way I would, as opposed to the way most people in AA would. Right. Well, I think, I don't think anybody should be afraid to examine their beliefs because the truth is irrefutable. It's absolute, right? So I like the idea of the spirit of the principles because those are absolutes. And I think at the end of the day, that's, that was what religion was trying to shoot for, you know, their ideals. And I had this concept that idea, ideals are like the horizon. It's a mental construct. Uh You know, you could walk towards the horizon, but you'll never get there. Yeah, it's not that's the exact same description I was doing of throwing a rock yeah, at the East I, was, I got that. Exactly the same. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah, they're just ideals that we're trying to work towards. And I think at the heart of it, I think that's what religion was aiming for. And then all this other crap got attached to it. Yeah. Because the, the, yeah, we're just the, human and we, the power and, we and fuck it all up. Politics and all that. Yeah. One, one of the guys that was a very stringent Christian it was... He believes in first century Christianity. What does that mean? Apparently, Christ's belief system was much more clean and clearly defined, much simpler mm-hmm. back in the in the first century. Mm-hmm. And he eventually rejected the church altogether and went focuses on that version of Christianity, mm-hmm. and uh, because it's much cleaner, much simpler. Humans much, do tend to complicate things. Much more well defined for him. Yeah. And he had <laughs> he had flown up. From uh, Orange County, mm-hmm. in order to do it for in in all twelve steps in three days, doing the alternative twelve steps. Oh, okay. And um, oh, this is someone you're working with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I just it was a one off. He's mm-hmm. an old friend of mine. And I said I'll I'll do this with you, but I promised him to do it two months previous, and by the time he, he had flown up, I had had a stroke. Oh, you did. Yeah, and it was a minor stroke, but mm-hmm. for about a month. My tongue was, you know, twice its normal size, and oh um, and I and I tired out really fast. Yeah. So I would read a couple of paragraphs, mm-hmm. and then I would have him read two pages. Okay. And then I would read a couple of paragraphs and two pages. Yeah. And he was really kind to me in mm-hmm. uh, the amount of effort he put into it because mm-hmm. he need he knew he needed to compensate for what I couldn't give mm-hmm. at the time, but it was important to me. To follow through on that because yeah. he really wanted to. Yeah. Well, and what is your experience? Like, what do you take away from that experience? Like, it was important for you to participate. <clears throat> do you feel it healed yourself during those processes? It always does. Yeah. Because I, I don't go into it with my ego running the show. Mm-hmm. I'm not going in, well, I'm the sponsor. You must bow and worship and drop my name at every meeting you go to. In fact, my belief system is completely contrary to that in, in respect to the 12th tradition. I don't want, the, my sponsees joke is I am the, I am he who shall not be named. <laughs> Voldemort. <laughs> because, because you are absolutely, you can talk about my sponsor said dot, dot, dot at a meeting, uh-huh. but you never get to say my sponsor Neil said dot, dot, dot. 
Oh, okay. Because the me isn't the important part of it. Right. It's the relationship of having a sponsor that's the important part. Yeah. Oh, God, I am so guilty of being like... <laughs> I love it when people draw up my name. I go, wee, on the inside. <laughs> and then there's like that other voice that goes, stop that. <laughs> yeah, well, my ego does. Yeah. My ego still wants to hear Arlena it. Arlena said, and I was like, that's right, bitches. <laughs> you know, like a little part of me celebrates. and Right. But that cock blocks me from actually getting anything out of <laughs> working right. the steps with them. Okay. When, okay. when I think that they need to remember that I'm the one that gave them this and to show me respect and yeah pass on the good word of neil <laughs> that that kills it then i don't get anything out of it okay when when i'm one-on-one -on -one looking you in the eye telling you the truth about me yeah. and hearing making it safe to hear the truth about you mm -hmm. that's when that's when the magic happens that's when huh? i keep healing yeah i get it i often oftentimes with my girls it's you know i don't feel that need to get credit when I'm working with somebody, uh -huh. it's only later. <laughs> like in the moment, I was like, wow, that is like magical. You know, when you're really just trying to be of service. Yeah. And somebody learns something. That I don't I don't know. Actually, you know what? What? One time. <laughs> you're so good. Go. One time I was at a meeting and a sponsee, she didn't name me. But she said that something I made, something I said to her made a difference in her sobriety. And it brought me, I instantly started bawling because I knew she meant it. Like, like I loved her dearly and she had been struggling. And there was something like that got healed in me when she said I actually helped her. It was like all that shit that I went through was a value like a value yeah all that pain and suffering was a value and it actually helped her and it was like a really humbling experience yeah that's that's beautiful and it meant more to me mm -hmm. i had closed a big deal and got a big fat paycheck it meant 10 times more to me like it i like the actual feeling was way better than the money the yeah. money comes and goes for me yeah. And it's like drugs. Like you get a big paycheck and you're like, woohoo. And then you need something bigger the next time to get that same. Right. Woohoo. Because yeah. <laughs> after a while, it's just like, meh, whatever. I'll spend it. Yeah. So, someone being kind, saying something that I wasn't expecting mm -hmm. in ways that I wasn't expecting. Yeah. That cuts through all the little Neil armor mm -hmm. and, and facades uh. and masks that I have up to protect myself from you. Mm -hmm. A, a simple act of kindness like that just yeah. sneaks right through all my defenses. Isn't that funny? And makes me leaky. <laughs> <laughs> you have something in my eye. And the fact that I can cry from joy yes. is the biggest testament I have to the program, the, the power of it. The, the, when I tell people this, the eyeball story, I was in a fight, my eye got knocked out, and I shoved it back in and finished the fight. Serious? When I tell stories like that. and. <laughs> You have not been safe, Neil. <laughs> when I tell stories like that and, and the guy on the other side of the table looks at me like, really? Are you sure you're not just a little full of shit right now? That, to me, is also massive proof that the program works. That they can't even conceive of this guy living oh, like that guy. Right. Is super powerful. That you are so different. Right. Yeah. That's good stuff. We do change. Yeah. We change a lot. Yeah, we do. But it's so incremental, we don't notice it. Sure. Really. I, it's, it's my friends that show up every half a dozen years or so. Mm -hmm. That are like, damn, you're different. You're still you, but your your energy is different. You're not as angry. You're fat now. Whatever. <laughs> you're fat now. And we, moved, we moved to New Orleans, and it was the death of me. I remember you guys were gone for a year, right? Yeah, yeah there's some good food in New Orleans. Yep. New Orleans. Yep. Yeah. And luckily, we lived in the Maronies. So we walked everywhere. Oh, that, okay. Kept some of the weight off, uh -huh. but man. My age is a bitch too, though. That'll change everything. Yep. Every 10 years. Have yep. you gained 10 pounds every 10 years? <laughs> kind of. I kind of. <laughs> Maybe five pounds every 10 years. <laughs> no. But that's interesting. So I feel like when we, you know, mentioned changing, I feel like we just become, like we let go of things and become more of who we really are. Yeah. I've heard also that, that your whole entire body changes uh, molecule by molecule. Over the course of seven years. Right. Yeah. And like, I've heard that periodically. And yeah. I, I don't know that there's truth beyond that or not. I've never researched it. 
But I've noticed in myself that uh, certain allergies I had when I was young, I don't have anymore. Yeah. I have some now that I didn't that have you back didn't then. Used to have. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I did. Um, I was sitting to be a nurse at one point, and and if you think about it, like all the all the cells, like even your organs. I don't know about your brain. I think I'm not sure that that your nervous system replaces itself the way the rest of your body does, but you're like literally not the same person. Right. Your bones, your skin, obviously your skin sloughs off and your hair grows out and stuff like that. Yeah. But, but my tattoos remain the same. But your tattoos <laughs> remain the same. I finally got one. Oh, congratulations. Yes. You rebel. I know. It's big, too. It goes all the way up there. Wow. Yeah. And you got it on a spot that hurts? Yeah, it starts on my lower right side and wraps up my side uh-huh. all the way up to... That's not fucking around. Almost my armpit. <laughs> I I'm I have mad props. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was like, you know, that is not an experience that I want to miss in my lifetime. My mama still doesn't know about it, so I'll nah. tell her. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be careful of my wardrobe when I go to mom's house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, you know, and it's in the summertime you see it, you know. Right, mom doesn't see it. Mom does not <laughs> see it. She would not approve. So she loves my husband. Oh, I'm pretty sure she likes him more than me. But um, <laughs> he got a three-quarter sleeve, and uh-huh. so it, it, like, peeks out under his, you know, a shirt, like a T-shirt, you know, right. peeks out the bottom. <laughs> oh, my God. But she didn't hardly say anything. I saw the change on her face. Someone pointed it out. <laughs> and she was like, oh, like, she was very quiet. <laughs> Trying to hold her mud. She said, yeah, she did good. But then she kind of was like, eh, whatever. <laughs> can do no wrong like literally you can do no wrong not even the tattoo uh-huh. yeah it was funny damn it i know it's not fair i know they're always getting up on me it's not <laughs> i had to draw a line i was like look you need to stop doing this <laughs> but it's nice that at least they get along right you hear all these horror stories do you get along with stephanie's family yes and she gets along good with yours uh-huh. oh that's awesome yep but yeah. uh, the only my sister and my niece are the only ones left of mine your sister and your niece mm-hmm. that's all you have left yeah Okay, your parents are gone. And yeah. What about your... Uh, I have extended relatives back in Iowa. Iowa. Okay. But I'm not really in contact with them at all. Mm. Never have been. Oh, okay. So that's not a big loss. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and most of Steph's family are all in the East Bay. Oh, they are? And we go up and see them quarterly. Oh, that's Her nice. grandma's 94 and still full of piss and vinegar. Really? She loves me. Kind of like your mom loves Bob. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was nice. That's more important, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're digressing. Uh, <laughs> you know what I was going to ask you hmm. about medication and like emotional or mental balance. And I know that <clears throat> a lot of people. I always, I was always kind of afraid in the beginning when I first got sober to like mess around with the chemistry. Uh-huh. Right. You see a lot of people mess around with chemistry, and I was worried for myself in the beginning that I would try to like we were talking about switching addictions. Because I thought once you start messing with your chemistry, then it's like you're kind of fucked, right? Cause... I'm not. I don't understand what, which direction you're going with that, though. Well, me personally fucking with my chemistry, or mm-hmm. under a doctor's supervision fucking with my chemistry, like antidepressants or yeah, bipolar meds or stuff like that. Doctors, because I feel like the doctors who dedicate their lives to people with mental illness, like bipolar and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. They actually tend to be kind of fucked up people, right? I can think of a couple, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, and so, like, the way I've seen some people treat bipolar, for instance, like, from what I understand, depression, and I'm not a doctor, I don't play one on the internet, but what I've seen, what I've observed is depression is like self centeredness to the extreme. And I, Correct me if I'm wrong, and I think you mentioned before you'd wrestled with depression, but it is sort of like this self-centeredness, and then you add uh, medication to that. It's like a pill to try to fix it rather than trying to change someone's focus to like being service-oriented or trying to think of others. Mm -hmm. And So if you start messing with the chemistry, then I don't know. It just seems like it leads from one medication to the next. Do you have personal opinions or feelings about people that take medication yeah. like, like i mean there's good and bad of it but what do you think about all that well by by your 
by your reasoning, if I just didn't eat sugar, I wouldn't eat insulin because I'm a type 1 diabetic. Oh, that seems flawed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, mental illness and depression and bipolar and various other sundry aspects of that. I'm not a doctor. Right. So I'm not going to right, tell you. Right, we're not you, prescribing anything here. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you what you should do with your medications or not. Right. One of my very absolute bottom line things, one of the only things I will fire a motherfucker over is if he's on medication and he's told me he's on medication uh -huh. and he decides that I'm good, I don't need it anymore, and he takes himself off his meds because he's feeling better. You're done. I will fire him because what happens inevitably is that you have this built-up tolerance, you know, in, in, a, in a crude level of, of that drug in your system. Mm -hmm. So you feel normal for a while and you're like, see, that proves it. I knew I didn't need that drug anymore. Right. And little by slow, it wears off and you end up depressed or manic or whatever is going on. And it happens so slowly and incrementally that you really do believe that everything is falling apart and it's everyone else's fault and you can't trust anybody. Mm -hmm. And I will bend over backwards to be there, save you, help you, try to brainstorm with you over what's going on that we need to, what we can tweak and change, you know, within your recovery mm -hmm. to try to fix that. And it was always way back in the beginning when you decided you didn't need to take meds anymore. Mm -hmm. That I will fire somebody over because you're totally wasting my time. Right. Over yeah. something that, that could have been changed like that. Right. I always, if most people that, that come into recovery aren't coming in not knowing they're depressed or not knowing that they don't have some other kind of issue going mm -hmm. on and they have a background of medication or maybe they don't. If they have a background of medication, I tell them, if you're on meds now, stay, stick Damn. with your doctor and communicate with him and or her and... If you decide you want to make a change in those meds or doses or whatever, mm -hmm. fill me in just so I know, but argue that out with your doctor. Okay. And then keep me in the loop just so I know. Yeah. And in the meantime, we will continue working steps. And if there's a change, there probably will be. Okay. If you haven't been on meds before and you're depressed, I'm apt, unless, there, unless there's like suicidal ideation or something like that going on, Let's finish the steps first. Okay. Okay. And and then let's see how you feel when we get to eleven or twelve. Mm -hmm. And then if you're still depressed, you're still, God, this isn't working. Then. Then let's let's see a doctor. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I was con you know, and I'm not clear about how I feel about it because, so my son actually struggled with ADHD, mm -hmm. and we were because of our drug history we're scared to death to put him on medication. And then we spent, a, a, like he, he, my sweet little boy, he was doing four hours of homework every night. Like I would sit there and I, I could, I would sit on my bed and I had my laptop watching and he's like messing around with shit. And I'd be like, hey, what's going on over there? And he'd be like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then he'd get back to his homework. And as we did this till he was in fifth grade. Oh. And, he, and there were there were many, many nights where he would like, be like in tears and I'd be in tears. I'd yell at him and I'd be like a fucking asshole. And it was like this whole thing. One day he comes into my room and he goes, I can't fucking take this anymore. And I was like, oh, oh my, <laughs> my sweet little angel drop and F-bomb. Like he just <laughs> literally lost his shit. Right? right. And so I was like, okay, Bob, we have to consider, we have to consider this because there was so much shame around putting your kids on medication. Mm -hmm. But I was scared. I didn't really understand. And, and uh, I still don't fully understand. But I did, we did take him to this guy and he explained to us how the limbic system works. It's a, it runs parallel to your blood vessels and mm -hmm. your arteries and how it directs the blood flow in your brain. And if you don't have interest in a s subject like math, like he struggled with math, he was not interested in it, and so his limbic system wouldn't direct the blood flow to that area of the brain that processes numbers, huh. right? And so um, he couldn't. There was no matter, there was no level of motivation, that I, external motivation that I could pro provide to him that would make that blood flow go there, you right. know what I mean? And so he just struggled with it the whole time. Well, finally we were like, fuck it, we put him on the medication. He is all A's and B's, it was like overnight. 
like all that and then I felt like such an asshole for making him suffer for so long right but we tried everything else first yeah the diet the exercise the all the weird little shit like they say oh play um, marching music or music that has like a certain <laughs> rhythm because uh-huh. it's supposed to help whatever so we tried all that shit and nothing worked until the meds and kicked in so but where I get confused is like I've had sponsees that were on like multiple things and then there was <clears> like this one one girl she probably won't listen to this <laughs> oh my god I tell this what she does but I just felt like something was off right and she was trying to get off this medication and she even like went to rehab I don't know what it was and I was always confused by it but I felt it in my gut that she wasn't doing it right like she was misusing it you know what I mean yeah and come and then it finally got and then she tells me that she relapsed and whatever and I was like you know what I don't know what to do with you I don't feel like I'm qualified to handle I don't understand your medication and how it's supposed like I don't get it so yeah well we're not supposed to get it but I didn't but you know she relapsed and I was like oh you were fucking lying to me that whole time maybe that's why I didn't I knew something was off but but that part is about the first step you know and and admitting to my innermost self right so she didn't admit to her innermost self that she was a drug addict or yeah she was running a hustle in the back of her mind with her meds that's what I felt I felt the hustle when I had my first amputation, I, I'm, I'm below knee on my right side. Your first amputation started with toes? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. My, my pinky toe in mm-hmm. 1995, when they took the toe off, they realized in the middle of the surgery that my, leg, my ankle was broken. <gasps> so they couldn't cast my ankle and they couldn't wrap my foot. And so I had to have my foot open for... <laughs> And let the side of my foot slowly close in on itself. Right. Or I packed it with yeah, gauze it. Yeah. every day and and drain it and, and treat it every right. day. And that was extremely painful. So I was on pain meds. Oh, okay. And uh, for about six months. Pain meds it, for six months? It took that long for the... the because your circulation wasn't well because of the diabetes? Is that what caused the toe amputation? Yeah. But okay. for the whole side of my foot to... Close, close in on itself because yeah. I couldn't stitch it they couldn't right. do anything I, I didn't know that either that it has to close from the inside out right yeah and uh, so that process took that long wow and in the meantime I become addicted to the painkillers mm-hmm. but oh, I don't gosh. know it because they're serving a purpose they're actually absorbing the amount of pain that I'm right, in right 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 and the day that the 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 pain in my foot went ow and the pain in my head went, ow, oh, God. <laughs> like Mr. Smith, the pain, the pain. <laughs> um, that, I, that day I went, okay. And I went to my doctor and I said, we need to do something. We need to change this. Wow. And he said, oh, you need something stronger? And I oh, said, no. no. Something the exact opposite. Okay, you want to go in a different direction. Yeah, I need to, I need to wean off and, and Interesting that. that he wanted to give you more. Yeah, a lot of doctors are like that. Well, I get that they're in it. They don't want to see you suffer, right? Right. They're trying to heal and remove pain at the end right. of the day. So I get their intentions are good. But, yeah. but, but it's up to me to be honest with them. Mm-hmm. They can't help honest. me if I'm not honest. Yeah. Honestly. And that's where taking the, the, what I learned in the steps, mm-hmm. I was able to take to a medical doctor. And when I had the mother of all nervous breakdowns at 20 years sober, I was able to take all the skill I had achieved at, mm-hmm. at practicing principles in my life mm-hmm to the therapist and actually be honest with her right? and take all the little pieces, all the cards that I couldn't put together and flip them all face up and mm-hmm. say, help me. Help me. Oh yeah. Just expose all that. But you must've had to really trust. Was it someone that you worked with regularly when you went to a therapist? No, I had never been to her before. Oh, you're just desperate. You're just like, yep. oh, okay. Because you knew yourself well enough after 20 years that you were recognizing. I was broken. Broken. Absolutely broken. Was it from the drugs or just a process of you just hit 20 and... Oh, no. It, it was the, my my redheaded higher power oh. <laughs> who, <laughs> who decided she didn't want the job. Oh. And I had literally given her everything, including that piece that I never give anybody. Which is? That that piece of my heart that I always hold back from, from everybody, oh, uh-huh. I gave her that too. But okay. I gave it to her all powerful. Right. My whole happiness, serenity, life, everything is contingent on you loving me. Oh, wow. 
and she could that's a that's a lot of that's, that's a, a lot that's and a lot. she decided she couldn't handle that yeah and so when she left i broke oh shoot i broke in a way i've never broken yeah and so and <laughs> janie got a bless her janie showed up at my house like two weeks after the breakdown had started mm-hmm. and she was strung out on meth her head was shaved and she was about 80 pounds and she knocked on the door and she said hi and i just opened up the door and let her in <laughs> and she lived in my garage for the next eight months wow loaded the whole time oh wow but Janie's like family yeah, yeah. and she pretty much saved me Aww. because she would amble into the room and she would feed me and uh, she would take me to the shower and bathe me Aww. i mean i was that broken wow. and she would give me equal doses of yeah she's a bitch and yeah you're an asshole yeah you know just to kind of give me hope and slap me upside the head <laughs> and she she took care of me for for six or eight months wow. and so the, she's one of my prime examples of you never know who gonna is going to be there to save you mm-hmm. and uh, she got sober with stacy williams yeah. Pretty, pretty quick after that mm-hmm. but i had nothing to do with that she was strung out the whole time she was in my garage but she saved me and yeah. and she kind of pushed me into you need help dude <laughs> yeah and 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 i was totally willing to do it because i was done having answers i got right. a big fat brain 137 iq mm-hmm. and it gets me in as much trouble as it does help me yeah, because intelligence is served is in service of the ego. <laughs> it's a it's a double edged sword. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's why I I push things to the degree that I push them because I mm-hmm. I have that hunger for more mm-hmm. knowledge and more understanding and more capacity to absorb what's going on around me. Yeah. But I also have very intricate ego and yeah. masks and right. armor around me. Right. You know that that I can lie to myself with. Right. It's so important to have people around you who can be honest with you and yeah. give the outside perspective that you trust and respect. Right. Yeah. yeah. And Janie had known me for 20 years before that. So. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you weren't going to be able to pull anything on her? Nope. <laughs> nope. And, and I was broken enough that I didn't care. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter what's, like you said, you just don't never know who's going to save you. Right. Yeah. It sounds like you saved each other. You gave her enough space to bottom out. Yeah, I guess so, huh? Yeah safe place to bottom out but do but doing that with the therapist I, you know, we did 18 months together mm-hmm. and uh, then one day she said I think we're done oh, and really? I said I think you're right felt good yeah because I, 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 and... I, I the book wasn't closed but <laughs> <laughs> but I had a lot you didn't of have new, to pay for it anymore <laughs> I, I had a lot of new information and a lot of new tools yeah. that I could practice and and part of that was in totally redefining what dating meant to me Oh. And and what connecting to another human being meant to me, right? And and practicing doing that differently, right? And that launched me off into the last. That was in two thousand one, two thousand two, and the last seventeen years, sixteen years since then, have been absolutely the best of my life. Isn't that great? And that's like the sort of the the hope of people getting into recovery is that the better half is yet to come. Yeah. Yeah. It's where I really under, understood the theme of the 12th step being the joy of living. Mm-hmm. And, and I yeah. really grasped that, right. both in working with others and in yes. enjoying my life. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I started going off into Burning Man and doing that and exploring and that to world. Go to the, yeah, I'm dying and, to go there. And that oh, was amazing. Uh, Do you still and, go? No. No, okay, you just did it for a period of time. Yeah, I, I, I was part of that community for half a dozen years, and I went twice. Mm-hmm. And that lapsed into the kink community. Mm-hmm. And, and I dove into that for a while, because I've been a dom for 25 years, but mm-hmm. I actually dove into that community and became a part of that community. Okay. And that was incredible, too. Some of the most loving, caring, honestly intimate people I've ever known. Even more than most people in AA. Wow! Listen, that is we're we're, at our, we're already at a, an hour and ten minutes. <laughs> I knew that was gonna happen. Can we make that the first topic of discussion for, for round three? 
<laughs> you're gonna, I have to have you just come on like once a month. Cause right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's interesting because you do have a community of people that need an opportunity to like, it's nice to be able to kind of get into it, right? And be able to talk things out. Oh, yeah. You have lots of friends who want to hear all your thoughts, your fans. You have a fan base. That's, that's <laughs> frightening. That's frightening. Well, it's a, you have a very unique voice, and I think people are, um, especially having your atheist framework, so many people need to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. I want to save everybody. I don't care if you, you get it through atheism or through Jesus or, right. or whatever. It's all about recovery. Yeah, we started, uh, uh, me and that guy that was... That I got the book for, and we read oh, it back uh-huh. to back. We started a, a atheist meeting on Thursdays at Cornerstone, mm-hmm. and the first couple of secretary th- three secretary ships, I had kind of a hover over and mm. make sure it was still all working uh-huh. attitude about it. Yeah. The, kind of the second tradition, the oh. elder statesman versus bleeding deacon. Okay, there came a point where it was rolling on its own and it was fine, okay. and it didn't need me anymore, and I walked away. Wow. And now I, I visit it once a month. And okay. the, the there's like 30 or 40 people there sometimes. Mm. And That's a small room, too. That means it's packed. Right. And most of the people there, I have no idea who they are. Oh. Which means that it's... The message is resonating. It's resonating. There was a need. And it's, and need. it's living by principles. Oh, that's awesome. And that's the two requirements for, for a group yeah. surviving. Is that there's this purpose for it. There's yeah. a need, and it's practicing principles. And it's practicing the principles, yeah. which are absolutes. Yep. So yeah. it doesn't need me anymore. I can just be another visitor. That's awesome. Well, listen, we'll have a whole other platform for all our atheist friends to be able to get what they need to get better. I hope so. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming over again, and I'll look forward to round three, <laughs> to hearing about your whole Dom kink thing. and In sobriety. In sobriety. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. I'm, uh, I have a blast. That's great. Yay. Yay. One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.